Welcome to On the Wet Coast, a podcast about sexuality and ethical non-monogamy of every variety. We talk polyamory and swinging, monogamish and open relationships, from dirty, dirty sex to heartbreak. We share our personal experiences and philosophies, observations and theories, what works for us, and where we fucked it right up. Join us on the Wet Coast. If you think I'm flirting with you, I'm just being friendly. If you think I'm weird and I make you uncomfortable, then I'm probably flirting with you. At Ideal Piper sums up my flirting style pretty well. Figuring out how to express our interest in someone can be one of the most challenging things in dating, especially if we find them really attractive, fun, or interesting. What do we say? What if they're not into it? Why is it so hard to express ourselves in a fun, clear, non-creepy way? If what everyone we know reports about themselves is true, no one is good at flirting. How the hell are any of us hooking up if this is a skill no one has? I'm Kat Stark, and thankfully, on this episode of On the Wet Coast, Flick Morrison and I are joined by Marsha Baczynski, master of the art of asking for what you want and dedicated flirt, who is here to share her humor, wisdom, and creativity in how to navigate the world of flirting. Welcome, Marsha. Hey, Marsha. Hi there. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> I'm so glad to be here. Yeah, <laughs> thanks Thanks for being here and uh, helping us with, with our, our our own flirting challenges. <laughs> you have to sit there while we talk about you for another minute or so. Okay. All right. So Marsha B. is a renowned speaker, writer, and coach on sexual communication, relationships, and women's empowerment. Her primary mission is to help women and the people who love them to overcome shame and get in touch with what they truly want, romantically, sexually, and relationally, even if it's off the beaten path. Marsha is the co-creator of Cuddle Party and the founder of the Good Girl Recovery Program. Since 2003, she has worked with tens of thousands of people through her private coaching, workshops, and group programs, and made appearances in hundreds of magazines, news stories, radio interviews, and podcasts. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I get around. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for sharing uh, your expertise with us. So, um, so what, um, where did you develop your flirting expertise? Was this just proficiency that you honed on your own or did you, is this something you actually researched and trained in? Uh, neither. <laughs> I wouldn't say I researched. I, I guess I kind of did. Um, so I was not a good flirt growing up. Uh, that was not a thing that I thought I knew how to do. It turns out I did sort of pick up some stuff growing up because I grew up in the South. And as a woman in the South, the, your primary mode of getting things that you need or want is never to ask. And it's to sort of be attractive and bat your eyelashes and sort of suggest that maybe you want a thing. Um, uh, and yes. so that was what I was raised around, but I was also raised by Yankee parents who weren't really into that. So it was <laughs> kind of a confusing, uh, <laughs> it was a confusing experience in some mm -hmm. ways. So, um, but it was also very, um, it was really challenging for me because, uh, you know, I was, I was already, even as a young person, like kind of outside the box in terms of my own romantic and sexual interests and, uh, the sort of environment that I was in just like, it was all very indirect and like suggestive and then you would flirt and then you might get something completely different. So I didn't, I wasn't a good flirt in the sense of getting anything that I wanted or anybody that I wanted. <laughs> I just got a lot of attention and like disaster. So <laughs> I wouldn't say I was good at it, but um, I moved to New York city in 2000 and uh, yeah. Wow. Poof. 2000. And I remember going to two things happened. One is I went on vacation about a year or two later to um, South beach in Miami and one of the things I noticed there was that all the men in the shops were flirting with me, but I was pretty sure they were all gay. And a lot of them were from Europe. A lot of them were Italian specifically. And I was like, oh, this is fascinating. Like, they're all flirting with me, but none of them want to sleep with me. And that was like a revolution <laughs> at the time for me of like, oh, you can flirt without trying to like make something sexual happen. Oh. So that was the first thing that happened. It was like, oh, it's sort of about like a game where you – you juice each other up and you flatter each other and you make each other feel good. And like, there's a little frisson, but it's not like, okay, now something's going to happen. It was sort of, that was a revelation. So that was the first thing. 
And then the second thing that happened was I started dating somebody who was a compulsive flirt. <laughs> he just flirted with everybody. And, and it was so funny because it would be like we'd get in a cab and, and some of it was just being like genuinely friendly. Like, hey, how's your day going? Oh, you know, and just making chat, chatter about whatever, small talk even. Um, and small talk gets a bad rap. But the other thing that I noticed was that it was he just kind of had this way of going around and making people sort of feel good. Mm -hmm. and he would flirt with the ladies at the bodega and he would flirt with the cocktail waitresses, but it was never like pushing an agenda. And so those two things have sort of clued me into, Oh, the thing about flirting is that you are, yes, it is a little bit about raising the sexual energy and it is about sort of, uh, kind of being suggestive, being like, there's, there, there's sort of a double entendre at play. There's like the normal bounds of conversation, but then there's a sort of subtext of just, ever so slightly and that's really key the ever so slightly is really key mm -hmm. ever so slightly outside the bounds of normal conversation like ooh what's going to happen next and it creates that that sensation of ooh i don't i don't quite know where we're at but it doesn't feel scary and it doesn't feel like i'm being bulldozed and it doesn't feel like i'm being railroaded because it's it's really close it's just outside the edge of yeah there's normal there's, there's definitely that line between flirting and hitting on somebody yes Absolutely. And they're not the same. They really aren't. Yeah. No. No, I, I think I think flirting. Um, if, um, if if you have plausible deniability, then you're still flirting. <laughs> totally. So this is actually <laughs> because I'm a nerd. I looked up the dictionary definition, and then I looked up the Wikipedia definition of awesome. flirting. Awesome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> before I started teach, I'm pretty much that's the thing I do before I teach any workshop. I'm like, well, what's what? How are people commonly like? If we were to look it up, what will we all find, right? Because mm -hmm. it gives sort of a common starting point. And one thing that I noticed in the Wikipedia entry, which I don't have in front of me right now, is that it was it really pointed to this sort of plausible deniability thing. It didn't say that phrase, but it talked about the suggestion that's just slightly outside the bounds of whatever the social norm is. And I think this starts to get at why people are bad at flirting. Right. Because, because they, they, they either go too far or not far enough. Right. They, they are either so worried about getting outside the bounds of the social norm that they don't go, they don't flirt at all, or they way overshoot the mark. <laughs> it's, it's actually funny how, um, like, undercorrecting can sometimes be just as creepy as going too far. Yeah. Where some where someone is you know is being friendly but not sort of signaling any like flirtatious interest but they're just like kind of too present to for it to not be flirting. If if that well, makes sense. Well, that's sort of where there's an agenda, right? Yeah. Like what makes flirting creepy is when there's an agenda, there's an there's an expected outcome, and good flirting sort of allows for a lot of possibilities. It's it's really playful, and it it's like it's the difference between somebody sort of coming over to. So a lot of people. Let me back up a little bit. A lot of people will say, well, the difference between welcome flirting and unwelcome flirting is whether or not I like the person, which there's some truth to <laughs> there's that. Some truth to yeah, that. that's fair. But that being said, there are a lot of people who have flirted with me who I have not been interested in, but because they didn't have an agenda and they were very comfortable with a variety of outcomes, it was still not creepy. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just wasn't into them. And so I think that agenda that like, I'm trying to make a thing happen. And there's like that urgency or that like tension or the rigidity or that like hyper presence but not actual flirting like that's not playful it's not fluid and it sucks <laughs> the, uh, the, the google result for defined flirting is actually pretty interesting uh it defines okay. uh it defines to flirt as uh to behave as though attracted to or trying to attract someone but for amusement rather than with serious intentions yeah, so I saw that dictionary definition, and I didn't like it, because <laughs> I think it's only partially true. It's so, it really is only partially true, right? Yeah, but that, that was the dictionary definition I got when I looked it up. But the Wikipedia entry is a lot more detailed. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, if you're nerdy and you don't know how to do things like me, then you go to Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> and you start there, and you figure it out. Um but yeah, so yeah, there's that, 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 but I do think there is an amusement thing. There, there can be kind of, um, 
we're never going to see each other again. We're obviously not going to sleep together for whatever reason. Maybe we are not compatible sexual orientations. Maybe we are ships passing in the night, whatever. It can still be fun to flirt. It can still be fun to like zhuzh somebody up or like give them a little juice or compliment their outfit or compliment, you know, their smile or something that they're doing, which is a key about compliments is compliment things that people have control over, not things that they don't. Right. Sort yeah. of rule number one when I'm talking about compliments in the context of flirting is, you know, compliment people on things that they they had a say over. So like don't compliment their tits or their ass or their cock or their whatever, unless you're much more intimate. <laughs> <laughs> to that point you're past flirting. But in the context of flirting, you want to compliment them on something that shows that you noticed that they have good taste or that mm-hmm. they have good style or they have funny style or interesting style or whatever. So yeah, compliment them on how they have, you know, their hair color, if it's dyed or compliment them on their makeup or their cute shoes or the thing they said or the joke they made or whatever. It's really interesting how, you know, you, you sort of de- described all these sort of flirting scenarios where there there really isn't any sort of possibilities on the table. And it's amazing how many people are so much better at flirting when um when it is when there when there are no possibilities, when it's somebody that there's there's definitely no uh interest or possibility, or like you said, it's you know, you're you're at an airport bar, and nothing's gonna happen. You know, right. it's, uh there are uh most people when there are when there are no stakes are are far far better at flirting yeah Mm -hmm. yeah i was just thinking that because like i i describe myself as a terrible flirt but in those situations i can be kind of flirty because yeah there's no stakes and it's it's only if i'm at a situation like you know at a at a, a a club or a party or something where I am actually wanting to express my interest in someone that mm-hmm. I just completely freeze up. But, you know, with the the cashier at Safeway or something like that, it's a lot easier to just be kind of charming and, and a little, you know, whatever. Um, well, and you're, you're really good at flirting with, um, with friends of all genders who you're not interested oh, in. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's that's super easy. Yeah. But if I am interested in them, I just sort of get white noise. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a really good point, right? So there's some people who don't flirt unless they think that something can happen. And then there's other people who can't flirt unless they know nothing is going to happen. Mm, yeah. And both of those are um, – I mean, and I think in the latter case, that's where we do get into that dictionary definition where you're just doing it for amusement. You're doing it for – you know, just a way to make somebody feel good, to make yourself feel good, kind of pass the time, like it's playful, but it's not quote unquote going somewhere. Yeah. Um, but then there's other people who only flirt if they have an agenda, which is, that's where you get the creepiness. And then there's that sort of in between of like, I don't know if it's going to go somewhere and I kind of want it to, but I don't want to be the creepy guy. And then I don't, you know, like you get caught up in your head. Yeah. yeah. And that's where our flirting styles might change. So where it might be fine, it might be really easy to be charming at Safeway. Charm may not be your kind of what you said at the very beginning of the podcast. Like you just start getting awkward. Then I'm flirting with you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that is this is where you know it, it, it. It's helpful to think of it as like you're throwing a ball, and yeah, if you're into somebody, you want them to catch the ball. But if they, the ball just falls on the ground next to them it's not a necessarily a bad thing. They may pick it up and notice it later and throw it back to you later. And then you don't notice it. Cause a lot of us are also really bad at noticing when people are flirting. With us. <laughs> I don't know what you mean by this. <laughs> it just be available for whatever reason. Maybe they're having a bad self-esteem day. Maybe they're in a relationship where they feel like they can't flirt because of their, whatever their agreements or unconscious choices, um, you know, whatever. So there's a lot, a lot of times there are people who, won't flirt back with us, even if we want them to. And I can give an example of this. Um, I was flirting with this guy for about a year. I'd, every time I saw him, I would try to have a conversation with him. I would try to like, you know, I would throw the ball. Basically, I'd be like, oh, and I was not super attached to something happening with him. But I definitely was interested. And I was definitely trying to make my interest known. And then I was teaching this class, the flirting class that I teach. And he was in the room and we started talking about gender and how gender affects 
flirting and socialization and stuff like that. And he raises his hand and says, women never flirt with me. And it was everything I could do to not call him out in front of 40 people. <laughs> and be like, please, I've been flirting with you for a year. Get over yourself, right? But, like, he just wasn't picking – like, I was throwing the ball, but he wasn't picking up the ball. He just and, – and when we talked later, some of it was that he had a story that women don't flirt with him. Mm-hmm. He never noticed when women were flirting with him because his story about himself was that women don't flirt with him. Yeah. So if I was a woman – Obviously, I was not flirting with him, no matter what I was doing. <laughs> yeah, 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 and you know, and and often it's it's subtle, and, and people, um, people often be, oh, they're 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 just being friendly, they're just having fun, and and it can both be true. They, it can both be you know harmless and mean nothing, but it's still flirting. Right, and the thing about flirting is that it's both. If it's, yes. if someone's yeah, yeah, yeah. genuinely flirting with you and letting you know that they're interested, they're also doing plausible deniability. Mm-hmm. That's tricky thing about flirting is that you know it's really easy to be like oh they're just being friendly no they're being friendly and they're letting your interest be known because they don't want to be embarrassed if you're not into them (laughs) (laughs) yeah and I think that's where like as a really anxious person I am terrible at reading flirting unless it's incredibly obvious because my anxiety over like what if I think they're flirting and they're actually not and the and the um, you know, the embarrassment and the shame that I would feel if, if I was misreading it. And so I find that, and again, like, with, with my anxiety, I find that I can't sort of be subtle when I'm flirting with other people. Um, Like, just, I just need to be super direct. So they know what I'm saying, and that there's no confusion. (laughs) Um, So yeah, that, that piece of it can really get in the way. Styles of flirting, totally. I think this is a good point to talk about. There's also a lot of different styles of flirting and people may or may not pick up on your style as well. So you talk about being really direct and the way that that particular situation got resolved was later on that day, I saw him and he had a piece of glitter on his cheek and I was like, oh, you've got glitter on your cheek. Do you mind if I get it off? And he said, no. And I went and got it off and I said, by the way, that was me flirting with you. And then I turned and walked away. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Because the other piece of flirting is that you want to give people a choice. You don't want to railroad them. So you like kind of throw them a ball and then see if they catch it. And sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. And if they don't catch it, that doesn't necessarily mean to not try again because, you know, again, obliviousness, right? A lot of (laughs) us have it. Um, But, you know, hitting someone up with a clue by four, uh, (laughs) (laughs) making it very clear that you're flirting with them if you already know that they're not good at picking it up or letting other people know, hey, by the way, if you want to flirt with me, clue by four works really well. Um, You know, that making it explicit, but then also in the making it explicit, giving people a choice, like still making it sort of an opt in. And that's where you start to get into consent as soon as things start getting more explicit and start veering into the quote unquote hitting on territory. You really, really, really want to like the choice in flirting is with the plausible deniability. As soon as you don't have plausible deniability, now we're into negotiation. Now we're into like explicit consent and verbalizing things and that sort of thing. So, but you got to like make it so that people really do feel like they have a choice, whether it's in the nonverbal, not explicit yet. No, we are just having a playful fun time. We're not trying to escalate that's like if that's their response then that you gotta like that's where the consent piece comes in this like it's basically about listening right (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah and and flick actually had a really great technique for when he was bringing sort of flirting into it or almost asking if he could flirt uh with people yeah Mm -hmm. i i um you know especially if if this if it's this thing where it's it's really ambiguous. You don't really know whether you know they're they're interested in sort of you know having a different kind of relationship. Uh, I would often you know sort of uh, pitch something with the caveat was like you know uh, gonna ask you something you know really awkward and you know if you want you can just shout smoke bomb and it'll it'll, <laughs> it'll disappear and we and we will never have to talk about it again. Yeah. So that's like diffusing the, that's sort of diffusing the directness, right? Yeah, but I think exactly. There's, there's other ways to flirt too. You know, some people are very, very physical. And so it might be just like, and this gets really confusing, I think also with women, flirting with women. <laughs> <laughs> 
We're constantly like, I don't know, she complimented everything about me, but I don't know if she was just being nice. Oh, yeah, that's that's <laughs> where that I find it even harder to read. Because, yeah, we tend to be, you know, much more um, affectionate with one another and much more complimentary. And, and yeah. even to the point of, like, if it's someone you know fairly well, like, oh, wow, your ass looks amazing in that skirt or something like that. That right, right, you know, totally. doesn't necessarily mean anything. But yeah, but so like, that's where like doing things like, okay, I'm actually going to be a little bit extra physically close, not necessarily crowding you, but uh, slightly closer than normally would be our default if we were just friends. But I'm not going to stay there. I'm going to like move in and then I'm going to move out again, giving that choice. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of it is that like, I'm not going to come in and just crowd you and hover. Yeah, you don't want to trap or corner somebody. You don't want to be too, yeah. But if you're like, Oh, I'm going to kind of move in and like be close and then move out and then not be far away, just sort of be in the normal range again and then like maybe dart in and then dart out again. And then after maybe two times of doing that, seeing if they start moving towards you. So like body language and non-verbally wise, you know, a thing that it, that you can do is sort of the the 90% thing. Like you go 90% of the way and then let them meet you that last 10% of the way, whether that's like physical space or like physical contact of like oh like you you put your hand right next to their hand or you like lean up (laughs) like your shoulder maybe shoulder to shoulder where it's not like oh can I touch your shoulder because you're not physically reaching out to touch it which Mm -hmm. might be a little bit more crowd like be a little creepier um or like instead of um you know holding their hand you like touch their hand and then you move your hand away and then but then you do it a second time so they know it wasn't an accident the (laughs) first time and then wait you know, and then people are like, I don't know, are they flirting with me? I don't know what to do. They still could go into that place. And and the thing about flirting is that awkwardness is inherent to it because it's about walking the social, walking the normally accepted line with that. Does it mean this? Does it not mean this? Does it mean this? Does it not mean this? So there's a there's an inherent awkwardness to flirting. And I think what makes somebody a good flirt isn't their technique or their style or their pickup lines. It's their comfort with their own awkwardness and the comfort. And the willingness to sit with other people's awkwardness. Really, I think that's all it is. <laughs> yeah, and... and like, the, I don't know, this is kind of awkward, but I'm going to do it anyway. And then maybe, you know, but I'm not going to crowd them and I'm not going to... So it's like attunement, listening, and then comfort with the awkwardness. Yeah, and, and that, you know, being really receptive and, and open to a no or a non-response. Right, um, yeah. And yes. I think that's what really adds to a lot of these things is, is, you know, being really ready, um, and accepting of like, I might not get anything from this and that's cool. And the same, you know, with, yeah. with like smoke bomb technique, it's like, I'm, I'm really, I'm giving you an out and like, this is, you know, absolute potential for no. And when I've done, you know, when I've tried to shift friendships and that sort of thing you know again i tend to be much more direct but i'm like okay if if you say no to this it's totally fine and it doesn't need to change anything um but you know i'm into you i think you're really cute do you think you'd like to like make out and see if we have chemistry or something like but i just like i really make it very clear that you know the no is welcome and it and i'm not gonna react in a way that it's like okay our friendship is over (laughs) totally Um, yeah, like the, the, there's a, that there's whatever the nor- whatever the the current norm is is an acceptable outcome. Yeah. yeah, whether it's like oh we don't know each other and I'm making a move on you, or you know we do know each other really well and we have a great friendship, but we maybe there's a little more interest. You know, and I think that's getting into that's starting to move the smoke bomb the smoke bomb technique. I think in some ways is even getting away from flirting and getting more into negotiation. It's like I'm going to make this explicit, and and take away some of the dis- some flavor of the discomfort is still the discomfort of having to make a choice but i'm going to take away the ambiguity and i think this is why flirting can be such a um minefield for people is that it's inherently ambiguous yeah. what people need yeah and that's uh, i think maybe why i hate it so much and, and i tend yeah. to just i tend to just go to the direct because like it's like i i don't like ambig- ambiguity like i'm right. i'm way too anxious for that <laughs> you know? And well, some people, some people are really like, and, and then when I, I often will ask in class, like, who here is, you know, really bad at noticing people flirting with you? Who here is really bad at, at flirting with people? And then who here thinks it's adorable when someone is kind of un, unsure what to do? 
in a flirting situation. And like almost everybody's hands go up. Like they actually, a lot of people find that attractive anyway. I'm like, oh. Oh, when, when, <laughs> when someone is, is like kind of blushing and like, you know, having, sort of having trouble sort of, you know, talking and, and that kind of thing. Like that's pretty adorable. I was like, those people are, are the sadists. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of them were the same people. So, yeah, but you like, know, what, like oh. it's it, it's it's funny. Like you 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 sort of talk about that negotiation phase as distinct from flirting, but I think it's a part. It's the part of the flirting equation that is hardest for most people. Is yeah. you know is is knowing when it's okay to you know as uh, as I think the kids are saying now shoot their shot and. Um, <laughs> Um, so, you know, so although it's not really flirting, it's, you know, that, that transition phase, um, it's still, it's still an important part of the whole puzzle. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because if you are just like, there's flirting just to flirt because it feels good. And then there's flirting because you're actually interested in somebody. And then that transition becomes a really important thing because sometimes, you know, you can flirt for a really long time and be interested in someone and they don't know that you're trying to tell them that you want to do something. And that's where you do need to get more explicit and, and the, and the giving people a choice thing in the explicit way with, I like that smoke bomb technique, <laughs> um, is really crucial. And that's, that's where the escalating comes in and escalation is like, so I like to say with, with flirting, there's kind of you're throwing a ball, right? And you don't know if they're going to catch it. And with flirting, it's sort of like there's three acceptable outcomes. A lot of people think there's only two outcomes, but there's actually three. One is it flops, and then you go back to whatever you were doing before. The second is they show interest back. And then you're into the escalation, and that's where you get into like more explicit negotiation conversations about, oh, what are we going to do with this mutual interest? Whether that's like making out or holding hands or having sex or going on a date or whatever it is. But then there's this third one. I think this is where um, it gets confusing, which is that sometimes you can just hang out in the flirting range for a really long time. And there are relationships I've had that it's just a really flirtatious relationship. And there have been times where I'm like, oh, is it escalating? I'm not sure. And it's like, nope, it's not escalating. We're just hanging out in this flirting range. And that's what the relationship is. It's a, it's just a very flirtatious Never going to escalate, but we actually also don't have to go back to normal conversation. We can kind of keep this innuendo and it's like double entendre and it's just like, oh, that's that's where we're hanging out. And sometimes it's just an interaction and sometimes it's like the entire relationship. <laughs> <laughs> but I think there is a point of like, oh, am, am I getting something, I'm getting something back? Okay, now I have to evaluate what is the thing I'm getting back. And then that's where making it clear, I'm a big advocate of that as well. Yeah, people, um, people can often end up... Uh sort of mutually stuck in that in that flirting phase indefinitely where yeah. they're, they're not really um you know escalating successfully and they're they're both very interested but um can't bring themselves to risk rejection so they're waiting for the other person to signal to signal unambiguous interest and they're both waiting you know and then eventually the interest kind of fizzles out because they they right. never they never went anywhere with it and and I th I think a lot right. of people have have found themselves in that kind of situation at at one time or another. Yeah, well, and that's where it can be useful to ask around if you if you have mutual friends. Like, what's the story with this person? <laughs> <laughs> like, do I need to be clearer? <laughs> Or is this, are they like, yeah, what's going on here? Or it's funny, yeah, you could be a little bit grade nine, like, you know, ask their friends yeah, if they're interested. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, and if you're in community, I mean, I do a lot of dating in community and a lot of the classes I'm teaching, I'm teaching for people who are in community with one another. So like that becomes a thing of like asking around and like, hey, is this person like, a like, do they have room on their dance card? Like, what's the story with them? And just kind of getting some context um, some people are just incorrigible flirts and they just like flirting and they're not actually indicating interest. And some people are doing their best they can to indicate interest, but they don't want to take that risk of rejection. And that's where I think we really all you know, kind of moving into the asking for what you want dot com phase of things, <laughs> <laughs> which is where 
you can find me. How's that for a plug? Yay. But that's where you're moving into the asking for what you want phase of an interaction of like, hey, this is fun. Like, do you want to go on a date? Do you want to hang out? Do you want and hang out is so vague too. Like, I like oh, to yeah. ask for an actual date when I can. Would you like to do something different? <laughs> yeah. Yes, I, um, I tend to be like, would you like to come over to my house and have sex with me? <laughs> 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 because, like, just, like, just, and then if they say no, it's like, cool, okay. And maybe they will have a counter offer of go for a hike, or maybe we just, you know, won't ever talk again. Or, like, just naming what's going on also, which is another approach to just sort of taking the ambiguity out of it. It's like, it seems like we're spending a lot of time flirting with each other. Mm. Just saying that. Just saying that and see what they say. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or even... And then that... I was thinking even possibly commenting about, like, how much you enjoy flirting with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh my gosh, you're so fun to flirt with. This is one of my favorite things to do. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Meaningful eye contact. <laughs> Meaningful eye contact. I would like to do it more. <laughs> Winks with <laughs> both eyes. <laughs> well, the, and the eye contact thing is actually a really good point too. So eye contact is highly culturally specific and also can vary a lot um, among, depending on like how your neurology is wired. So oh, it's, for it's sure. hard to say like, you know, you should make eye contact for X number of seconds and stare meaningfully into their eyes because some people just take that as a challenge and run away. Um, oh, yeah. I, it's not a challenge for me. It's a horror show. It's a, yeah, right? <laughs> like some eye contact, winking, eyebrow waggles, as cheesy yeah. as they are. So much of flirting is cheesy <laughs> or can be. Um, it's like, hey. I, re- I remember my, my high school boyfriend we were both like too smart for our own good, and we would do a lot of like meta commentary in our <laughs> flirting. And I re- even as like 15, 16 year olds, and I, I have this really funny memory of we were watching a movie at my friend's house, and it was one of the first few times we hung out. And he just made this like huge show of like the stereotypical thing you saw in the movies of like the guy yawns and he puts his arm around the girl. <laughs> <laughs> So exaggeratedly, so that I knew he knew what he was doing, and the, the, so it just became this like very funny thing, and that stuck with me my whole life because I was like, oh, that's a like sort of doing the stereotypical thing, but in a like, yes, I'm doing the stereotypical thing, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, like that is also kind of a funny way to flirt. <laughs> yeah, it's funny how you know being ironic about flirting is actually just flirting. It is just flirting. Yeah. It's like, oh, look at us. We think we are above all this. But we, are not. <laughs> we are finding ourselves in this awkward moment together. So we've touched <laughs> are on... Are you enjoying this awkward moment of flirting with me as much as I am with you? <laughs> I am subtly expressing interest through my body language. <laughs> I, am, I, I actually do enjoy the, like, the the audio commentary of the flirting of like, you know, like, wow, that that's a really great top. They say for flirtatiously, (laughs) you know, um, and actually, you know, articulating that kind of thing to, to just kind of highlight the awkwardness and highlight the like, yes, you are reading this correctly. Yeah. I can't can't remember. Giving you a prompt here. Yeah. (laughs) I can't remember exactly what it was, but I remember, you know, um, a, making a, a joke that didn't land and uh, the, you know, the, the person was, you know, just a little confused. And I was, I was like, I was like, oh, I was just trying to be really smooth and flirtatious there. So. Right. It works really well. And then that, that, that sort of like, I, yes, I am flirting with you. Yeah. Like, like the time I went up to that guy, I was like, that, by the way, that was yeah. flirting with you. Yeah. Uh, the clue by four, right? It takes... It, it is a way of easing the the way for the other person. It's sort of like a, which is a, a generous and kind thing to do, um, especially if you suspect that they might be as awkward as you are. <laughs> <laughs> so we touched on it a few times uh, indirectly, but, you know, are there actually differences gender wise in how people flirt? Well, there's a, there are de- there are differences, and a lot of them are socialized, which you figure out really quickly as soon as you take it out of any kind of heteronormative vibe, right? Like even if you're still dealing with men and women, if it's not the the stereotypical norm, all of a sudden the flirting styles change. You can see that at a femdom party, 
right. the sty- the flirting styles change, right? Like if, if there's female dominance and male submissives, it's not the same flirting you see in a bar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> most mm-hmm. most singles bars, right? It's just it's a different style. So most of it is socialized and a lot of it is gender coded. So like, you know, women playing with their hair or, you know, um, like cocking their heads and sort of leaning in. I, I wish I could show you visually, but um, there's there are things that are, you know. The side eyes. The side eyes, like, you know, having a straw in between your, you know, in between your lips and like making eye contact while you're drinking out of your straw, whatever. <laughs> the thing is, like, those are all kind of coded female or feminine or whatever word you want to use there. But they're not necessarily, like, they they work really well when you're doing gender fuck too. So mm-hmm. it's, it, it's, um, there's nothing I think that's hardwired particularly, but there is a lot of stuff stuff that is coded around our sort of the, the, the ecosystem that we're in both whether that's the larger culture of you know i have to show that i'm a, I'm a man and i have to show that i'm a good provider because our economic system privileges men over women and men make more money than women and that's how it's supposed to be so if i don't make more money than her then like you know so i have to wine and dine her like kind of yeah, approach to flirting yeah. or if it's like a subcultural like I have to show my political wokeness, like whatever you're, whatever the thing. <laughs> yeah. So we're, we're all sort of in our, our circumstance and like trying to signal something with our flirting. So I always think it was like, no matter what our gender is, like we're all like the little, the, the birds that with their feathers sort of doing their display, trying yeah. to get the attention of the other birds that we think are cool. Um, yeah. <laughs> they go watch YouTube videos for that. <laughs> I love those little birds of paradise with all those, yeah. Yeah, their, oh, their yeah. crazy little dances. Yeah. Like when I watch people flirting, I usually have that, the birds of paradise <laughs> from YouTube, like playing through my head. Oh yeah. That's really perfect. <laughs> And I actually give my clients who feel like they're not good at flirting or who are trying to learn how to be better flirts, I give them the assignment to go to a place where um, people like to a club or to a restaurant where a lot of people have first dates, that kind of thing. And just like watch the body language Mm. because the body language is also a thing that is, again, is quite gendered in heteronormative context. But as soon as you get out of the heteronormative context, it it changes considerably Mm -hmm. Um, how men in a bathhouse pick each other up is very different than even at like a lesbian sex party they're different things but then you know it's also context dependent right so um yeah anyway there's gendered things they're socialized um but then it depends on the circles you're moving in i guess is the the upshot of that (laughs) (laughs) yeah and and i know talking to a lot of um people who um women or femmes or assigned female at birth talk about like trying to flirt with other people uh, of the same gender or similar gender. Um, It just, that's sort of where it often becomes difficult because we are used to doing the the friendship flirting and then um, attempting to have it, you know, be clear that it's more than that, that we're interested in. And even when you're at like a, a swingers resort or a sex party, it's still sometimes hard to make that clear when you're not used to, like when you're like, no, but I, I, I mean more than just that, you know, that swimsuit is great or whatever. Like, <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I know like so many people say how hard that is mm-hmm. and, and, you know, they just don't know how to, how to talk to women. Um, but, and I and admit that's usually where I get the white noise and the word pretty, and I just <laughs> lose all vocabulary. Um, but uh, yeah, it it seems to be, and especially people who've been like maybe in heteronormative relationships and are now exploring outside that, it can be mm-hmm. really challenging to figure out how to like make that like cross that line from friendly flirting to like no like real actual flirting would you like to kiss me (laughs) yeah well and i think this is this is true regardless of the gender of the people involved like as soon as you're out of the hetero norm like i talk to a lot of men who don't notice that they're being flirted with because they've never been socialized to think that someone might flirt with them because their job is to do the flirting right. and to face the rejection. And I think when I talk, and I, certainly when I talk with a lot of people who are raised and socialized to be girls, the, the same thing is at play, whether they're flirting with 
you know, people of similar gender or flirting with, you know, men or whatever, masculine folks or whatever. It's like, oh, my value as a, as a woman, whatever, we're going to just sort of estimate genders here, <laughs> but my value as a female coded person is in my attract, my ability to attract. Right. Yes. So the rejection is like, First of all, putting myself in the position to be rejected from an explicit overture is like, I, am I desperate? Am I am I so undesirable that I have to do this? Like that's what goes through a lot of folks' heads um, if they've been raised, you know, in that sort of female coded way. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, like if I get rejected, I don't have much practice with that. I don't know like what it means. And then meanwhile, you've got, you know, men, people socialized to be men, whatever on. Tinder just swiping right on everybody that like they might remotely be interested in because like it's a numbers game. I don't know, man. Like I just have to, <laughs> like, I just have to face rejection over and over and over and over and over again. And then the rejection becomes not so terrifying for some guys, certainly not across the board for sure. But like it, it, it really just, I think takes practice on both sides on being able to like notice when people are flirting with you and then also being able to make a move. Um, that's, that's more than like, you, wow, you look cute. I'm just going to leave that there because you're probably straight, <laughs> <laughs> which was my style of flirting for a long time. And then I realized, oh, actually, I've managed to surround myself with queer women. Maybe I should actually think they might be interested in me <laughs> yeah. occasionally. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But when we don't have our picture of ourselves as desirable, regardless of our gender, it, flirting also becomes really hard. No, and I, I and I think that that is that is where a lot of people become so um so Im impervious to the the flirting that is actually directed at them is because you know they they don't they don't really see themselves as as attractive so uh they they interpret all those things as you know people just being you know friendly and playful and mm -hmm. couldn't possibly be flirting or expressing interest there was a big turning point for me when i dated somebody who used to play this game with herself and she used to, she used to just walk around like whenever she was like sort of getting into a period of low self-esteem or whatever, she would play the everybody wants to do me game, <laughs> which was basically she just walked around and like looked at people and be like that, that person wants to do me. That person wants to do me. That they're all just too shy to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> and just like, it's such a dumb game, but it actually works. I recommend that you all try it for like a week and just see how it changes your reality. Just like that person wants to do it. It's just like, I have so many options. We, we all have so many options because everybody like it gets you out of that scarcity mentality of like, there's like three people maybe ever of all 7 billion that want to fuck me. <laughs> yeah. That's... Like, no, everybody wants to do you. It's just a question of time. <laughs> it seems like it'd be a fun thing to do with a friend. Like, you know, just say, you know, Hey, that person wants to do you. And just, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, speaking of like something similar of the self-esteem boost of um, I very recently decided I might uh, try to be uh, more of a unicorn this year. And so I posted to one of the local swinger groups about like, hey, it's been ages since I've been able to unicorn for a cute couple and posted like a thirst trap picture. <laughs> and like seriously, like within like within minutes for sure possibly within seconds i started getting all of these messages <laughs> oh, yeah. and it was just like yeah there's just really wonderful like i'm super cute um, <laughs> kind of moment and yeah and just like chatting with people and stuff it just yeah really buoyed my self-esteem up in that way so i can totally see the walking around thinking yeah they want to do me they want to do me because a lot of the time it is actually really true yeah it's like i don't have time to invest in making that happen but it yeah. doesn't mean i don't want to do you <laughs> <laughs> yeah what? i think there's another oh go ahead oh no i was gonna say one of the lines that i that i come up with with come up against as someone socialized female is that I I sometimes fear flirting back because of that whole like what I might owe in that situation. Yes. Um and that is something and I think that's part of why I am so, you know, dim about, you know, being receptive to flirting is because it's like, no, I just I can't read any of this as flirting and I can't react as if any of this is flirting because I don't want to give them the wrong idea and lead them on. And then quote, you know. lead them on. And then if anything happens, it's my fault. Yes. Yes. 
totally real fear. So this is a thing when I'm working with my students in the Good Girl Recovery Program, one of the things I talk about a lot is the reason we got to get really good at boundaries is because without our ability to say no, our yes is meaningless. And without the ability to say no, we become doormats. And so, and this is true in and out of the flirting realm, um, being able to very clearly and powerfully say no and like change the tone when needed and be willing to be a bitch in someone's eyes. Um, but also, you know, using the sort of the good girl tactics and appeasement if the situation seems dangerous, because a lot of the reasons that we have these things, you know, sort of trained into us is that they are survival techniques. Yeah, for sure. Um, in sort of like, okay, like, so some, some, some piece of the, the flirting equation is like, am I in a safe environment? So if I'm flirting in, in the poly, if I'm at a play party and it's the poly community and I know a lot of people there and there's, you know, generally a value around consent and things like that, that still doesn't mean nothing quote unquote bad will happen, but it's, it's a much say safer environment than a bar on a Friday night, mm-hmm. like a random bar on a Friday night where like no one is accountable to anyone. And, you know, if I flirt back and then, especially if it's with a man, um, I don't know if he's one of the 90 good, 90% of good guys or the 10% of guys will take me in the alley and slit my throat for not getting his way. Like, I just don't know that. Yeah. And so, you know, there is a resistance, I think, on the part of people who come across as female in the world to just be like, I'm just not going to engage in this at all because it's too dangerous. And so a big piece of that for me has been about finding places where it's safe to flirt mm-hmm. and then being able to like practice my boundaries in those kinds of safe containers, which often is again, not perfectly safe, but safer than the bar, um, you know, in communities where there's a value around consent and like people can talk about stuff or with people that my friends have vouched for, but only if my friends have good taste. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, and I think getting comfortable with the giving ourselves permission to change our minds is also a mm-hmm. thing because that is something that's been fairly enlightening for me is like this idea that you can be kind of into something and then change your mind. And so by, you know, by being a bit receptive to flirting um, and then backing off to get away from that, oh, you're such a tease and you led me yeah. on, you know, that kind of um, story that we that we get that that's kind of the worst thing you could ever possibly do to someone. Mm-hmm. Um, but be like, no, I have permission to change my mind. And so just getting like teaching ourselves to be comfortable with that um, can be a way to try to find that ability to. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. The changing your mind is such a crucial, crucial part of it. And when you're changing your mind, what's happening is you're responding to the present. And a lot of us act like if we say yes to something, or even if we say no to something, we're like signing an eternal contract that we will go until the thing is done, where done is usually determined by the other person, not ourselves or external circumstances. Yeah. Um, although one would hope if like a fire broke out or an earthquake happened, like that would be a sign that maybe whatever was happening <laughs> was changing. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, it's, and it's also not just changing your mind. It's also like, I am a yes to this point. And that point doesn't have to be penises inside of vaginas till yeah. one person has an orgasm and falls asleep. Like, and I think one of the things that's really for me, that's been really awesome about being in the both the poly world, non-monogamy, whatever you want to call it, sort of open, consensual non-monogamy world, and the kink world, is that there's so much more um, acknowledgement of the gradients in between. And certainly Cuddle Party, which I'm the co-founder of Cuddle Party, and this is a thing we talk about a lot in a non-sexual way, like there are so many lovely pit stops that are perfectly acceptable destinations that for whatever we're doing, for whatever we're playing with. And so like, if I have it in me where I'm clear how far I'm willing to go, I'm clear what my boundaries are. We're going to go that far unless the other person's boundaries are, you know, sooner. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, that's how far I'm going. And like, I'm not leading you on. I never implied anything beyond that because I had that clarity. And I think when we have our own clarity, like for example, um, I'm very clear about what my, say for sex boundaries are at play parties. Like I just have a standard for myself and what that standard is, is not relevant to this conversation, but (laughs) I'm clear what it is and Mm -hmm. and yours might be the same and yours might be different. But if you're clear what yours is, 
then I'm flirting with you within the realm of what I'm willing, where I'm willing to play. Mm. And, and when we defer our boundaries to what the other person wants, that's when we get into deep weeds. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not, true. it's fine to change your mind on your boundaries too. That's acceptable as well, obviously. But, um, not knowing at all what your boundaries are and then going, I'm just ho- going to hope that they figure it out for me. Yeah. <laughs> like flirting's really dangerous if that's your relationship to boundaries. Yeah. <laughs> when feeling entitled to have boundaries is something that yeah. is something a lot of us actually have to learn. A lot of people have to learn that because a lot of us didn't get that growing up. Like we either didn't get it um, from our families on basic stuff, or maybe we did get it on non-sexual stuff, but then we didn't get it from our early sexual partners and no one taught us that. Mm-hmm. Um, and we didn't internalize it and we have to internalize it on a somatic level. So like, I think a lot of why flirting can be uncomfortable is that a lot of these things are ambiguous, but you don't have to make it clear necessarily with the person you're flirting with. If you have clarity in yourself about this is what I'm up for, this is what I'm not, that can also resolve a lot of the anxiety. It's true, right? If if you if you're comfortable, um, you know, uh, giving an uh, a clear, unambiguous but compassionate no, then yeah. it can make flirting a lot easier because mm-hmm. you know that if you decide that that's as far as you want to go, that you'll be able to to pull out that no when you need it. Yeah, yeah. There's like there's a lot of power in being like, no, I'm not up for that. Let's do this other thing, and like also making a counter offer. Uh huh. Yeah. So that they're not continuing to push, because that's another thing I think. Also, you know, speaking as somebody who was raised as a girl, and more or less as a woman, <laughs> gender is complicated. Um, you know, the idea that we can make counter offers is really foreign. I think to a lot of us, it's like, no, I'm not up for that, but I am up for this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, like, it's a, actually a mutual negotiation rather than a gatekeeping situation. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, it's it's interesting because I feel like there are some parallels between uh, between flirting and sex where, you know, a lot of the sort of classic view of sex is that uh, sex is um, is penis and vagina. And mm-hmm. so everything else that you do sexually is really just a precursor to that leading up to that. Whereas a better view of sex is that all these things that we do are sex. And that is just one of the many sex acts we can do. And mm-hmm. similarly, if we can view flirting as a destination and a continuum that we can, we can enjoy rather than just, just a, uh, you know, a step to getting to, um, to that, uh, proposition. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. There's, there's, um, I always, when I teach my consent classes, uh, one of the things I'm really trying to get people to move away from is this idea of permission yeah. and more towards a model of agreement. Mm-hmm. And that this, like, consent is an agreement about how we're going to play together. And that play piece is actually really important because all of the play, all of the places in flirting are play, all of the places in sex have an opportunity to be play. I mean, mm-hmm. if you're trying to have you know, conceive a baby, maybe it's not, but like (laughs) there are circumstances under which sex is not play, but like a lot of the time, that's what it can be, um, centrally exclusively or, or primarily, you know, like play is a, is a, it's a way of us interacting together, not a thing you're getting from me. Yeah. And if, if the interaction I'm having is I'm trying to get something from you, we're not playing. Yeah, there's an agenda, and that goes right back to the beginning and of why, same, you're why not flirting. Yeah, and then you're not flirting; you're being creepy. You have an agenda, and you're, maybe you're seam rolling them, or maybe you're you're hanging back. But we're not playing, and so it's not fun, and it's not juicing people up. And then it's this: you're trying to let your interest be known, but there's no sort of recognition of the other person may have their own set of interests that you could collaborate and see what the Venn diagram overlap is and have a good time. Nope, you just view them as a source of getting whatever you want. And that's also like, I, I'm not going to put that exclusively on men, even though s- around sex it's often like men are trying to get sex from women. That's the, mo- the 1950s model that we were sort of raised with. <laughs> yeah. Where, where one true. is, one is a provider and the other one is a consumer. Right. It's, but it's true also in the inverse, like, and I see it in same sex relationships, like someone's trying to get something from the other person. Mm-hmm. And it's really hard to create a playful interaction. And it's really hard to actually, have an expansive model of consent. I mean, you can still have a permission based model of consent, which is certainly better than nothing. I'm, I'm for that more than nothing. 
but uh, but there's so much more available when we stop seeing the people that we're flirting with or the people that we're having sex with as like means to an end, like validate. I'm flirting with you so that I can be validated that I'm a attractive or worthy person. Uh-huh. <laughs> like good flirting sees the other person. Good flirting is like, oh, you in particular. Yeah. Because of these reasons. <laughs> and that's why it feels so good whether or not we're trying to escalate it. That's where the, the good feelings from flirting is like, oh, that person sees me. Yeah. They noticed something about me that was ha- that matches how I see myself. Yeah. And, and being seen like out in the world and, or, you know, at events or, you know, even from your, your partners, like it just, it's so fulfilling and it just really helps you be like, Oh yes. Like I am a person. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I'm a person and I'm a person that other people sees and thinks there's something cool or valuable about me. Isn't that nice? Yeah. That's how your flirting interactions are leaving people. You're doing great. (laughs) Awesome. Well, that's probably sounds like a pretty great place to wrap it up. Um, Why don't you tell us a bit more about where everybody can find you on the internet and that sort of thing? Yes, I'm moving everything gradually under um, everything except for Cuddle Party, I should say. I'm moving under askingforwhatyouwant.com. But if you want to find out about the Good Girl Recovery program, you can go to goodgirlrecovery.com. And then Cuddle Party is cuddleparty.com. So askingforwhatyouwant.com is the main thing. And you can find out about my coaching and my workshops and travel. And there's a bunch of blog posts and all kinds of stuff over there. Uh, And your Twitter? All of my social media, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, FetLife, although I'm not very active on FetLife, is Ask Marsha B, M-A-R-C-I-A. Ask Marsha B. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, this has been a lot of fun. This was great. Thanks for asking me to be on here, you guys. (laughs) It's our pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. The audiobook version of my book, Yelling in Pasties, The Wet Coast Confessions of an Anxious Slut, is now available on Audible and iTunes. It's also available on ebook and paperback. Go to Amazon.com or visit OnTheWetCoast.com for links to other marketplaces. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or your preferred podcast platforms to help more listeners find us. Just a few sentences make a huge difference in our visibility. Contribute to our Patreon to help us have more adventures to tell you about. Patreon.com slash on the wet coast. And a shout out to our newest Patreon supporter, Tina. Yay! Thank you, Tina. Follow us on Twitter at Wet Coast Cat, at Sirius Flick, at On the Wet Coast. And email comments or questions to contact at on the wet coast.com. Go to on the wet coast.com for Cat's blog and more. And check out other awesome sex positive podcasts on the Swingset Network at swingset.fm. Oh, hello. I didn't see you there. I'm Dylan Thomas, co-host of Life on the Swing Set, the podcast. We share our experiences in swinging, polyamory, and beyond. You're listening to a Swing Set Network podcast at swingset.fm.